Um, I met Doug Stillwell about uh, four years ago at a seminar that uh, David Langford was giving down in Indiana. And Doug had just been named superintendent of the Riverdale School System at that time. Uh, Riverdale is Riverdale, Iowa, pretty close to Des Moines. Uh, he was just starting the transformation with the help of the Deming uh, philosophy at that point. Uh, Doug got his, uh, his doctorate at Drake University, where I almost went to school. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, my counselor said that I should study uh, actuarial science in Drake University at one of the best programs, but as it turned out, I didn't have a personality, so I went up the street to, uh, to get an engineering degree instead. But Doug and I had something in common that we both uh, are attempting, and I, I think you only start uh, to attempt a transformation in an in an existing organization, and that's uh, that has some perils associated with it. So, if you would please welcome uh, Doug in exploring the idea of trust in the school system. Good afternoon. You may be wondering what in the heck this picture has to do with anything, and let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, this past year, we were uh, we lost two of our central office administrators in our school district, and we were able to hire two really great people. They make up about half of our uh, central office administration. So, in preparation, I thought it'd be a great idea to go and uh, do a team building exercise with them over the course of the day. And someone recommended to me, "Why don't we go to Camp Dodge and go through the leadership training course?" I said, "Great." We got all the way through it. This was the very last event. And the task was to go, there's another wall on the other side of this one, but it was to go from one wall to the other and then dismount <laughs> successfully. <laughs> well, on my office door coming in, there are three questions that Dr. Deming asked. For what problem is this a, a solution? By what method will you improve? By what method will you know that you've been successful? I think at that point, I was probably not using the three questions particularly well because what I thought would be a good idea at that point, and, and while people have exaggerated the height of the wall, someone said it's anywhere from 8 to 10 feet, it's about 6 feet. <laughs> I scooted over there, and there was pea gravel on the ground, I thought, why don't I just hop off? So I gave it a little bit of a hop, and about 20 seconds after that picture was taken, I was lying in the pea gravel, looking at my fibula sticking out of my leg, and my foot twisted this side of my leg, and the three questions just never came to me. So those three questions really, uh, had I asked them, I wouldn't be in this uh, predicament with a crutch in another year probably of rehab, but uh, so be it. The uh, work of Dr. Demi, uh, particularly as we've been introduced to it by David Langford, has been significant in our district. Um, we are now into our fifth year of what we like to think is our transformation, and I believe that we are getting to a point where we're reaching a tipping point, and the tipping point, I believe, is because the board, in addition to supporting our work, is now doing the work. When David came and spoke, uh, had his very first four-day conference with us, I asked him to speak to our school board, and we have a video of that, I won't show it to you, but one of the very first things that David said was, there's nothing wrong with the teachers in your district. And I'm sure my board was wondering, what in the heck is he talking about? Well, now, five, nearly five years later, they understand what David was talking about. They understand that not only do the teachers and all this in the system need to be working on the same thing that they do as well. So really pleased about where we're headed as a district and we are certainly not there yet. However, the topic for the conversation today is, is trust as a systemic structure for innovation in schools and organizations. Trust is a topic I've been very interested in for about 12 years, had the opportunity to present at the National Systems Thinking Conference. Um, at the beginning of the uh, 21st century. Um, and a little bit of a twist based on innovation and based on the work of Dr. Deming and how it's influenced me to better understand the topic. So I think there's something deep about trust. I think there's one of those things that um, are, is perhaps unknown and unknowable. But if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you would enjoy working in an organization where distrust, dishonesty, deceit abounds, how many of you would want to work in that organization? Okay, you do. Yeah, that's my test. No one wants to work in that organization. 
So it tells me there's something, um, and, and the more you look, learn about psychology and trust, it, it bears out, but we don't have to do all that much research. We know that trust really is important in organizations. And as we think about it in terms of creating organizations that can help innovate, we find it's even more important. Typically, and this is where I began, looking at trust from the perspective of interpersonal relationships. And if we look at several definitions, you can read how that is defined. And the way we typically have looked, looked at trust is basically on an individual basis. Do I trust you? Do you trust me? What are the things that are making me not trust you? That's what I typically hear a lot, is why isn't the other person trustworthy, rather than maybe a question I would ask myself. So the interpersonal question for trust, from the interpersonal perspective is, am I behaving in a trustworthy manner? Now please don't get me wrong, please don't misunderstand. It's important for us to behave in a trustworthy manner. It's important for me as a superintendent of schools to behave in a trustworthy manner. I'm not sure that's enough. In fact, to be honest, again, I sometimes don't ask that question. I ask, what's wrong with other people? And what I found is, as maybe you found, is I can't control other people. I can't control how trustworthy they behave. There's one person and one person only I can have that influence with. That's with myself. So that is an important question. Am I behaving in a trustworthy manner? I want to just give you a moment to think about yourself with that. Maybe you're like me, maybe I like maybe you like to look at other people and figure out why they're not doing that, but am I? Ask yourself that question. Am I behaving in a trustworthy manner? And it, perhaps more so, do we have people, do we have critical friends who would be willing to tell us if we're not? I had a situation last year <clears throat> where we were doing some moving of staff and it happened into the school year. And by moving some staff, I needed to hire a teacher for a position that we call teacher on special assignment. Within our contract with the teachers, it says if a vacancy occurs within 21 days of the school year or during the school year, you basically don't have to follow the contract line, you just get it filled. And so this opening, this vacancy occurred after the school year began, so I just filled it. I followed the contract. And I subsequently heard about it from our teachers union. They felt I had used that language. I had waited until the language would be in effect. They felt I was dishonest for having done that. And I have to tell you, I was crushed was absolutely crushed. Why? They didn't trust me. I followed the rules. But they felt I found a different way to get around the rules. So multiple conversations later, multiple hopefully ways I behaved later, I hope I have built back that trust that was some I lost. I don't know if you've ever been on that end of the conversation when people doubt your trustworthiness, doubt your integrity, it's pretty tough to take and it's hard to defend because you sound, anytime you defend it, you sound like you're guilty. But that's a question I have to ask myself every day. Now there's a different perspective that I came to about 12 years ago is that trust isn't just about interpersonal relationships. That trust, in fact, is the, is the underlying condition in all human interactions. Do you trust me? Do I trust you? And as an underlying condition, it implies that it's a structure that supports interactions. So yes, trust is about people interacting, but trust is also a systemic structure. So when I consider an iceberg model of trust. Is this okay as my pointer? <laughs> On the very surface are our behaviors, the things we do every day, 
the interactions we have with people, the way we respond to them, the way they respond to us. And by the way, I want to make a distinction between trust and like. Some people will say, I don't trust you, when what they really mean is, I don't like you. And sometimes I mean both. So we have the behaviors. There are patterns of trustworthiness that we can see in organizations as we watch them. It's not so much of what we say, it's what we do. Years ago, one of the accrediting accreditation agencies in the United States was the North Central Association. One of the things they would ask us to do before a site visit was to write down our mission and vision. And I came to the conclusion one year that people thought it was crazy. I said, we shouldn't write that down. Well, they said, we're supposed to. I said, I know we're supposed to, but we shouldn't. They said, why? I said, we should have them come in for four or five days, watch us, and then they can tell us what it is. Because if we're not exhibiting it, it's really not uh, our mission and vision. So these patterns of trustworthiness come next, and then these <coughs> systemic structures of trust are at the very bottom of the iceberg. Now, several years ago, when I did my presentation at the National Systems Thinking Conference, I had written the systemic structures of trust, but I didn't know what they were. I thought it sounded great, but I couldn't answer what was there. What I've come to realize after using um, systems thinking, Dr. Deming's work, for me in Urbandale, what is at the bottom of that iceberg, those systemic structures, is our mission, our vision, and our values. Everything in the organization is built upon that foundation. For those of you that were here earlier with Leander, Texas, they had, their, they had certain principles that they went throughout the entire organization. I believe that was, that's the bedrock of their organization. So the interesting thing in Urbandale is that up until three years ago, we didn't have a vision statement. We had a mission, it's teaching all, reaching all, but we didn't have a vision. So we went about the process over the course of a year involving multiple stakeholders to develop that mission, that vision, and then to craft it into a mission, a vision statement. Urbandale will be a school district that brings learning to life for everyone. And then our values. What are those values that support that? Innovation, continual improvement, the pillars of character as defined by character counts. Those are the structures. I look at these and I am reminded of one of my favorite authors, and it's C.S. Lewis. Anybody ever read his books, his children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia? Well, in the first book, he talks, in the first book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it's a magical place. And he talks about there's magic that happens, and then there's deep magic that happens, and then at the very end of the book, you find out about this deeper magic. So, connection I make is that this is kind of the magic, this is the deep, deep magic, and this is the deeper magic. Everything goes back to the systemic structures. Everything. That's why it's also important for all of us who are leaders to help people to know what our mission is, what our vision is, and what our values are. Not only by what we do, but in a very explicit way. Peter Senge would say one of the new roles of leadership, and I, I laugh at that because and he wrote his book, The Fifth Discipline, that's been over 20 years ago. And I still believe this. And one of the new roles of leaders is to be the steward of the vision. So my role as the official leader in our school district is to continually share what our vision is. Um, one of the things, and again with David's help, that I found is the language in our district. We're often talking about our vision. We're often talking about it, connecting it to everything that we do. But it becomes one of our structures of trust. So it really asks a different question. Rather than, am I being trustworthy, which is still important, I ask a new question, particularly as leader. Am I creating systemic structures that support trust in the entire organization? Am I doing that? I think David talks about this also. Everyone can look and see some system of which they are the leader. Imagine if we had every person in that role, teachers or leaders of their classroom systems, building principals or leaders of their building systems, and on and on, 
What if they ask that very same question? I would offer that increasing trust and developing trust addresses, is it point number seven or eight of Dr. Deming's management principles, which is try about fear. When we engender trust, when I work to create structures, when we work to create processes, we are building the foundation for people to behave in a trustworthy way. I'm going to stop there to see if there's any questions or comments. And, and I, here's the one thing I would like to share with you. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to serve as a thought leader for Bill Bellows on this very topic. And after having done that, what I realized was there's a bunch uh, more smarter people than me on the telephone at that time that I was able to learn from. So one of my goals in coming here was to be able to present and also to be able to learn from those that might be in the session. So any thoughts on any of this? Um, did it strike a chord? Does it, you're saying that absolutely not? Yes. I remember when they came back talking about mission, mission statements and all back in the 90s. And when you talk about organization and trust, that's when I started doubting whether or not schools are about children. They became businesses. It wasn't about what we're doing. So when I look at what is your mission, everybody in God's creation knows what schools are there for, to educate the children. To me, the mission and the vision is more important. So how do we overcome the idea that this is a business versus we are an extension of the population? We are an extension of the family to provide the citizens that will care for the world. Hmm. Well, in some ways, we are kind of a business. We do produce. We do produce learning. David said that this morning. I mean, from being so businesslike that we feel like we're not part of the society any longer. Um, I've got a few simple answers, but of course, it's a complex issue. Um, we are in, in Urbandale. We are a community school district, right? It's not my school. People talk about superintendents. My school district. It's not my school district. It belongs to the people. It belongs particularly to the people who entrust us with their children. So my sense is when we work to build mission, vision, values, we involve the people whose children we're teaching, we're helping to learn, and we involve the community that is providing the funding to let us do that. If I sit alone in my office and create the mission, vision, and values, they will go nowhere. But I need to know from parents, even though I have some sense, I need to know from parents, from the community, what it is that they want from our school district. And I have no idea why this went black. Now it's on in my computer. Oh, thank you. I'm sure we all take year-long courses in how to engage the community. But again, what do we do short of having a mission and vision? I would offer that many school districts and many organizations have a vision statement. It's the thing that we all know hangs at the central office, or it's in the principal's office, or it's somewhere. And when you ask people, what is it, they don't know. I would offer, if they don't know, we don't have a shared vision. We have a vision statement. But when it comes to life, when people cite it, when they say we're doing this because in Urbandale, we want to bring learning to life for everyone, when we make those connections explicitly and implicitly, we know that we have a shared vision. And that shared vision and acting with it as a guide for us in our interactions is what can help support trust in our school districts. So that's the new question for us. What are we doing as leaders to create those structures? Left alone, they won't be created. Uh, if someone else takes over, they don't become something that we own. 
So what am I doing, what are you doing to create those structures that support trust throughout the entire organization? And believe me, I know not everyone's going to trust in an organization, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to give you a few more things to think about since we're talking about innovation. This is why trust is so important with innovation. In innovationtools.com says the innovation process requires considerable amounts of trust. Well, that's kind of like a duh, right? We know that. Really? But I just want to reinforce that. And without trust, the process is unlikely to produce much more than incremental innovation. Now, incremental innovation we might call continual improvement, but every now and then we need that breakthrough, don't we? That real innovative piece that separates us, takes us to the next level. Henry Dawson, 2013, says, Trust is what drives effective innovation leadership. Innovation needs leadership. There's a, when there's a high level of trust, leadership interactions are efficient and things just happen faster. In other words, for me, if people trust me, if I trust other people, the amount of stuff we have to deal with lessens and doesn't get in the way of trying to achieve our goals. I think about the number of um, incidents in our school district where teachers have filed grievance in my five years as superintendent. In fact, in my 10 years in the district, now you think of one. So instead of spending our time worrying about grievances, um, we have more of a sense of trust and we can make things happen faster because we have this level of trust. Now we have to be careful with that, what we call political capital or an emotional bank account. Because if I keep withdrawing from it without putting deposits in, I'll get overdrawn and people won't trust. And finally, trust is needed under uncertainty. And part of innovation is that it's uncertainty, right? I don't really know if this is going to work. I really don't have any idea, didn't have any idea that we were going to create this thing called the sticky note at 3M, right? In some ways, it was by accident. So trust is needed. If trust is needed, if we want innovation in schools and organizations, if we want that innovation, we need to develop trust. And not, again, just only from the interpersonal, but from the organizational side. So this is my one fancy chart I came up with. I couldn't do any better than this. So as your need for innovation or uncertainty, as that rises, the amount of trust needs to rise as well. Here's one thing I struggle with, and maybe you do or don't, but I struggle with this a lot because one of our new board members uh, reminded me that Ronald Reagan once used this phrase, and you finish it for me, trust but verify. Now I'm thinking, is that really trust? If you're trusting someone, you don't need to verify. Empower and verify maybe, but at some level, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile that? So as the amount of innovation Uncertainty increases, the amount of trust needs to increase as well. So let me go back a little bit and talk some more about systems. Our good friend Archimedes once said something like this, give me a lever long enough and single-handed I can move the world. Here's the challenge. There was no lever long enough for Archimedes. Sometimes there is no level long enough for us. But it introduces the idea of leverage. And I want you to think about this in the context of the amount of leverage that a high trust versus a low trust organization can have. Now, I've been toying with this for about 10 years, this model, and there's always something wrong with it. This is my newest iteration. But the fulcrum in this situation is trust. The closer it is to the goal, which is innovation, the further away it is, it takes greater effort to make it happen. So when there's not trust, when people don't know whether or not you're going to steal my idea or I'm going to steal your idea, when people become closed, when they don't collaborate, it's harder to make innovation occur. But when we develop more trusting organizations, high quality trusting relationships, the fulcrum moves to the right and the load arm is easier to push. It doesn't take as much effort to make the innovation happen when there's high trust in an organization. So, I'm not putting myself in the same class as Archimedes. 
but I've got my own little quote, and you can just use it all you want. So instead of lengthening the lever, we move the fulcrum, which in essence is doing the same thing, isn't it? We move the fulcrum closer to what we want to lift. By moving the fulcrum, by improving trust, we can inspire and support innovation. So what I'd like to ask you to at least comment on is how might you, how might your organization, or what is your organization doing currently to develop this thing that we call trust? I'll give you a minute to think about that and ask you to respond. And, and frankly, if you hit, raise your hand and say we're not doing anything, then I appreciate that honesty as well. Working with uh, my clients, for example, one of the things that we do to build trust is put the tough issues and topics out on the table. If, um, if behaviors are happening that um, create fear and, and um, shatter communication and understanding, then we talk, we talk about those things and um, we just say, okay, look, let's look at these things as opportunities for us to understand and learn and work together to make improvements and to think about what are the ideas, the, the creative ideas we have, but in order to innovate, we need to take those ideas and put them into practice or take them to market, and we can't do that if we're not all supporting each other. So I think more and more communication focused on um, what is our aim and how are we serving each other and customers um, helps with that. So bringing the tough issues up for discussion, among other things, and not being afraid to hear what people have to say. Yes, sir, in the back. Make it clear to everybody that work is being completed and how that work is being completed. Trust often breaks down when people don't see other people's work being completed and then they think that it's not. And um, so that's, that's what we do. Make it explicit that work is being done. Because what can happen is we make the wrong assumptions, don't we? If we don't know it's happening, we can leap to the conclusion that it must not be happening. Absolutely. Thank you. Any others? I would say asking for feedback and then acting on that feedback. I remember one of the very first session I went to with David Langford. Um, the chairs <coughs> were awful. I mean, they were so uncomfortable. It was just terrible. And so he, he asked us for feedback. I never had that happen before. And I thought, okay, well, the chairs are rotting. So a bunch of us put that in. You know, he said, well, you know, give us your suggestions for improvement. So we went away to lunch and we came back after lunch and the chairs are different. More or less comfortable. <laughs> I know David. Um, you know, they were, they were very comfortable, but I, I remember what a profound impact that had on me personally in terms of, okay, this guy isn't just talking. He's, um, he's actually listening and he believes in what he's saying. So um, I think both gathering the input from people and making sure that you're letting them know if you uh, act on it if you can, if not, explain why you can't. Now that transparency piece, isn't it? Uh, there's, there's something to give, giving people voice. And we've talked about it. The ultimate place that we would like it to see it happen is in our classrooms. Yeah. I think about your own K-12 educational experience. <clears throat> Did you really trust what was happening in the classroom? Were you asked to give your feedback? Were you validated? Didn't happen very much for me anyway. So we can, there are things we can do to improve trust throughout the organization. And when we do that, it sets the, the systemic structure. Or earlier someone talked about the culture, earlier we were talking about the culture to support innovation. One of the things that helped me to get a better handle on this notion of trust, and I'm somewhere on this spectrum I'm not clear to the end. There's so much to learn about trust. 
but looking at it through the lens of the system of profound knowledge helped me to gain, um, I think, a different perspective. And so this next part is going to be somewhat interactive. Where I'm going to ask you, and I didn't know everyone's level of understanding of the system of profound knowledge, so we'll talk about it a little bit. And I'm going to ask you, what does that have to do with trust? Okay, so we want to make some, some very explicit connections between trust and each of the parts of the system of profound knowledge. So the first idea is the appreciation for a system. One of the things we're working on in Irvindale is we're working uh, with the Baldrige criteria. Anybody familiar with Baldrige? Okay. So we just use that as a structural framework. And what we know about that is even though there are seven parts to it, they are all interconnected. No one of those pieces stands alone. Although they talk about the hamburger model, moving from the organizational profile to the measurement analysis and everything fits inside of that, they are all interconnected. And so the thinking about, of course, a system is that there are interrelationships that are the most important to understand in the organization. Now, from what you know about appreciation for a system and what you believe or think about the trust, how can appreciation for of a system support trust in an organization? If you want to talk with a neighbor for a minute or so to think about that. What do you think? What does appreciation for a system have to do with trust? I saw you chatting. I heard you chatting. I'm trusting that you were focused on task. <laughs> what do you think? Is there any connection? to talk. I look at every aspect of this. I use my colleague right here who gave me the term Q-tip. Quit taking it personal. If you're looking at everything in the system, it takes personality out of it. You're dealing with issues. So you stop worrying about what someone says and taking it personal. It's dealing with each issue. What is it, what is it we're working on? It's not about a person, it's about the thing. Something that's getting in the way for that person to be successful. And so right there, I think it's the biggest thing that builds trust. Because when you stop taking it personal, then it's, you realize you're not attacking me. I'm not attacking you. And then it's not personal. Absolutely. Yep. Sometimes hard to accomplish though, isn't it? There was another hand I saw go out of way in the back. Thank you, Dick, for jogging around for us. Yeah. You just a little bit faster. Uh, <laughs> so um, if you have an appreciation for the system, then you have an appreciation for your part in the system, which means you understand your work better. When you understand your work better, you understand the work of others better, which allows you to build trust that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and you know what you're supposed to be doing. And you also lose the lack of trust in yourself that you're not missing something that you should have been doing. Nice. Thank you. Right up here. You know, I'm not sure this is the right time for this question, but as you're talking about, the, you know, the, this question of trust and and this sort of internal system that you're building here, I keep wondering. What about all those forces from the outside, um, you know, whether it's common core testing or new teacher evaluations imposed by the state? 
um, that I think a lot of school districts are dealing with. How do you maintain the integrity of the system when you have all of these forces that I think are pushing against them? And if you think they don't push against them, I'd love to hear them too. We just ignore them. <laughs> we just act with them. I've reached, I've reached the early retirement age, I don't care. I think what we do with those, we've talked about that, because we're all pressuring out. We, if we're in education, probably every industry. I've never worked outside of education, so I don't know. But I'm assuming every industry has those forces. I think one thing we do is that we understand they're part of our current reality. And instead of me trying to fix it myself without involving other people, I involve other people. So I'm saying if, if, if you involve me, what you're telling me is you trust my something about me. And so we use people's expertise. We may all say that is the most interesting thing we've ever seen come our way, and we have to address it. Let's do it as a team. And through that teamwork, we'll get a better answer, I believe, and we'll build that sense of trust because it's not just because Doug's a superintendent with a certain level of education, blah, blah, blah. It's because there is something within all of us to offer. I think that will build the trust. Um, one thing I would offer about this notion is that I think trust is systemic in itself. I try to think about what trust <coughs> doesn't touch in an organization, in a classroom, in an interaction. I believe trust touches everything, and in that way, it is the definition of being systemic. The next piece is knowledge of variation, right? There are two types of variation. There's common cause and there's special cause. I use a, a popcorn container for a very particular reason. Um, although cooking within the same system, right, whether you put it in the microwave or on a, in a pan on the on the stove or you go to the movie theater, all the popcorn kernels don't pop at exactly the same time. Can you imagine the noise that they did, right? Because of that, we get this nice little poppy sound that we all know it's what it sounds like. That's, a, that's variation, that's acceptable variation. And the majority of the popcorn pops within a specified time. That's com there's common cause variation in the popcorn that you eat, okay? That's common cause, and that's acceptable. Sometimes, um, some pop way too early and subsequently they burn. Some don't pop ever, and we call those old maids. That is special cause variation. What's caused that to happen? I'm not really a popcorn expert other than I like a lot of salt and butter on it. Other than I don't know. But that's variation. So, same question. What is it about variation that connects to trust? How can that inform what we know and what we do in terms of building trust? I'll give you again about a minute to talk with a partner and then we'll share out again. So what is it that we need to know about variation that can inform us about trust? Thoughts? Dick. Uh, Doug, so I don't have to run. Um, is trust a variable? Yes. Next question. <laughs> I think it's a variable in every relationship, isn't it? In fact, it may be the most important variable. Well, when you understand variation and the system starts to become more stable, therefore it becomes much more predictable, then trust level goes way up because people start to really believe, oh, okay, 
it's going to be here tomorrow and it's, it's predictable. And so they don't have to worry about their job or their uh, performance review <coughs> or anything else. They can worry about the job itself and the relationship with their peers. Absolutely. And then that answers Dick's question about prediction. Thank you, David. Here's what I, okay, there's a question way back again, Dick. You're going to have to put on those jogging shoes. Can you move? Yeah. Everybody needs to come to Dick rather than Dick coming to you. Um, most projects are currently run by project plans, which deny the existence of variation. Everybody misses their deadlines, their goals, their objectives, which destroys trust. Uh, having an appreciation for the fact that variation exists means that we can give more leeway to people um, producing things in a natural time frame rather than in a natural time frame. Absolutely. David, you talk about not having, uh, help me with the right word, you don't call them deadlines, you call them what for kids? Target dates. We have target dates. So you've got some space for variation in there. One of the things I think, yes ma'am. Here comes Dick. I think that understanding that variation exists is really understanding the system. And the moment you understand that variation exists, if you are part of those who burn too fast or too late, you understand that you are part of the system and somehow it gives you trust to contribute and it gives the leader trust to integrate you in the system. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing in Urbandale this year is um, uh, to use the Gallup survey for employee engagement. And some of the things we hope to learn from that is to what degree people trust the system. So, in terms of common cause and special cause, if 95, 90 to 95% of the people in our system fundamentally trust the system that informs my behavior. I don't, um, I, I probably need to find my outliers somehow and figure out what to do to help build trust with those folks. So if the greater part of the system trusts, we know that we're doing something common cause to influence that trust. So. If I just listen to the few people who are the naggers and the complainers and the whiners, and there's some in every group, right? There has to be, because there's variation. If I apply, if I take their input and apply it to the, the whole organization, um, David, what's that term called? Deadly disease. The deadly disease. It's a deadly disease. So I want to make sure I understand what the variation in trust means about the organization. Is it just coming from, from a small percentage of the folks, or is it coming from a large percentage of the folks? It tells me what I need to do as leader to try to improve that level of trust within the organization. So theory of knowledge. We really um, get challenged to test our beliefs um, using data. And so one of the things we're we're called to do is to use some kind of process, including the PDSA, to determine whether or not, I think earlier this morning we talked about how we, how we know what we know is what we know or something like that, right? So the piece that strikes me with this is in our school district, where we are continuing to move towards is to create processes and procedures based on PDSA, so when decisions are made in our district, it's not just Doug as superintendent wielding his superintendent wand because he wants to. It's not just a teacher in a classroom doing something because he or she wants to. It's knowing that we have a process in the Urbandale School District for improvement, for solving problems, that's not going to be arbitrary. I can trust the process. If we get into a group, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me anymore how often the term PDSA is, is used. It's just incredible. It's one of those pieces for me that continues to inform that we're on the right track, that we're getting there, our vocabulary is changing, which means our thinking is changing. 
So if we have in place processes and procedures that people trust, then I think there will be greater trust for the organization for the decisions that were made. Although still there are some times when pieces of mistrust arise. Recently we've been working on a facility plan for our elementary schools which are in need of some, some improvement. And we have a board subcommittee who's working on that. And some people in our district think that this is a secret committee creating these plans that no one knows about. Well, the board has the right to create a subcommittee to work on some things, but we always share back at the, at the regular board meetings. So it's nothing that's a big secret for us. But it continues to reinforce me that we still need to work on trust. So that's the way I look at the theory of knowledge in terms of putting a process together so it's based on data. Again, Doug just didn't wake up in the morning and think that we wanted to do this. Some people have said, why did we even go to this quality continual improvement stuff? I said, well, David Langford, I just give him his phone number. <laughs> no, it's because we can go, we can find the research, not only academic research, but we can go to school districts like Leander, Texas, and we can see what's happening in these schools in Australia or Canada. We know that this stuff works. We can point to other examples. You know, as you all know, it's the transformation of the Japanese economy that, that thrills me. My gosh, if Dr. Deming's work can transform an entire economy, you ought to be able to help do something in the little old Urbandale Community School District. So again, decisions aren't arbitrary. There is a process that we reach to get to those decisions. Psychology seems to be the most easily connected piece <coughs> Uh, between systems, uh, between um, trust and organizations. Now, likely we talk about trust and we talk about the psychological state. But Dr. Deming really talks about um, psychology in terms of people changing. What happens? We talk about it, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So think for a moment and share for a moment what connection psychology has from Dr. Deming's perspective in the system of profound knowledge, what connection does it have to trust? And how can we use that to improve trust in organizations? Is there a connection between psychology and trust? If so, what is it? What do we, what does it tell us? I recall Dr. Deming talking about within this uh, topic, uh, fear and what causes people <coughs> to fear change. And I think uh, people don't fear change, I think they fear uncertainty. And if you can build trust, then you're going to um, figure this work out together and test ideas uh, that will help build the certainty that they can trust you and that you can trust each other and I think uh, that minimizes the fear and actually helps people to, to pull together. Thank you. Others in the back? So I know Dick has to run back there. Okay. Let's fight as far. Dr. Deming talked about the forces of destruction, like grades in school and gold stars and so forth. And basically, over time, with the extrinsic motivators, also just beats out the creativity in, in children and 
um, in, in the system, in the relationships. Um, so there is that, there are so many hundreds of kinds of fears, and those fears, whether they're fear of change, uncertainty, making mistakes, fear of failure, fear of, fear of success, uh, fear of speaking up, there are so many that um, they, those keep eroding and then they just erode it at the trust level and impact the behaviors and between individuals and the impact then on the organization and, and the outcomes it may be able to optimize and deliver. When we use rewards and punishments to uh, motivate learning, we almost send a, a message of distrust, as if you won't do it unless we give you a reward or punishment to entice you to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So definitely there's connection between psychology and trust, and hopefully what we've seen today, what I would encourage you to do is to think about one, trust from the organizational perspective. Yes, the interpersonal is important, but the organizational piece and the system of profound knowledge can really help tie that together for us. So we've seen all of the, all of the parts of the system of profound knowledge have an impact and are impacted by trust. So as we try to improve, in this case, my case, the school district or other organizations, I'd like to ask yourself, what role does trust play? Is it currently supporting or hampering your efforts? And if it's hampering your efforts, what can you do to improve the level of trust so that subsequently we can get to a place where people feel a little bit freer to innovate for us so that we can make those um, large steps we need to make as organizations to get better? I'm going to skip the first two questions and really just ask you to think about this. These are the questions we always ask our folks when we're uh, in conferences with them. Okay, so what? So what about this self-trust? So I want you to think about that. I'm not going to tell you so what. I know what the so what is for me. What's the so what for you about this? And next is now what? Now you've just figured out the so what about it. Now what are you going to do about it? And you may be in a part of the organization, as we talked about earlier, you may not be able to make the wide sweeping changes. Well, I tell you, what I found even as the, as, the, as the official leader of the school district, I can't make wide sweeping changes happen very quickly. It takes time. And no matter where we are in the organization, we can impact that. So I would ask you, now what? Now what will you do with anything that you take away from this today to improve the level of trust in the organization through the lens of the system of profound knowledge in order to increase innovation? In order to increase the performance of people within the organization. Finally, I just want to leave you with one thought. When leaders and managers understand that intrinsic motivation is lasting motivation, when they implement systemic and systematic processes for improvement and decision making, when they understand the system is responsible for most of the behaviors and don't look to blame individuals for common cause issues, and finally, when they understand and appreciate the interconnectedness and interdependence within their organizations and what that means pragmatically, you know, it's different than you have it in your head and doing something with it, they will be well on their way to building and maintaining a sociocultural system. That's what we're talking about with people. It is sociocultural, which is why trust is so important. They create this sociocultural system of trust that permeates and supports the entire organization. I want to thank you for your participation, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.